Test. All right, so uh, we'll get this session started. So this is a learning session. Uh, I'm happy to see that there's more and more learning coming to ICAPS and see, I, I ran the uh, learning track two years ago and this year, and I think, I think the quality is getting better and better each year. Um, I am looking for somebody to propose the learning track for next year. I think I might have one person who, who might do this, but it's nice to have two people in charge. So if you're interested in this, uh, contact me. I, I'd prefer not to do it again so I can submit something. Uh, that, that, would, that would be a nice thing to be able to do. But uh, let's get this uh, uh, underway. So the first talk is going to, actually the first two talks are going to be by Masataro Asi. And the first talk is going to be towards stable symbol grounding with zero suppressed state autoencoder. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm Masataro Asai. Um, yeah, i am talk about this. First, uh, well, so this presentation consists of two parts. The first one in Latplan, uh, the previous work, which is pretty long and also a complex system, so I have to describe this thoroughly. And then after that, I describe the my contribution in the new paper. Uh, this is a joint work between me and the Hiroshi Kajino, uh, that is also from IBM Research AI Japan. I'm moving to IBM uh, Boston, uh, Cambridge. Um, so classical planning with PDDL model is quite capable. It can solve uh, eight puzzle optimally well under 0.1 second. But the problem is that they cannot solve the uh, image-based part A puzzle. Because for this kind of problem, we don't have any PDDL models. Um, so that makes, um, unfortunately, it makes it the classical planning mo not really practical in uh, real world environments. Uh, some environments that are unknown, and no mo there are no human that is able to model the environment. Uh, so we must, uh, to solve that kind of messy problem, we must automate two processes to, f to um, solve this uh, knowledge acquisition bottleneck. So first one is symbol grounding, that where the symbol in this uh, presentation I specifically means identifiable entities in PDDL, like objects, predicates, uh, propositions, and actions. And the action model acquisition, that describes the transitions we're using the symbols that was, that was found by the another uh, previous process. So, so um, the system that solves these two is, um, is the LAT plan, Latin Space Planner I propose in uh, AAA 18. So this is a planner that runs in a binary latent space that is embedded inside the neural perception. So the, there's a lambda inside the brain. Yeah. Um, our task is to solve an image-based A puzzle without providing any prior explicit knowledge so there's no symbols like um, the nine tiles or that these tiles could move. So only given the raw unsegmented uh, unstructured images. Uh, because we don't have any assumption about the environment, uh, solving, it should be able to solve any planning task, including the Tower of Hanoi or the, the game Lights Out uh, that was shown on the right. So the system is essentially a domain independent but image-based classical planner. The system is given two inputs, training inputs and planning input. The training input consists of uh, image pairs. Each pair is uh, some pair of states, uh, images, before, some, before and after some action is ex executed. Like in this example, the tile six is moved downward. And these transitions are randomly sampled from the environment and they are continuous and noisy. Um, there's no description, state description, unlike AlphaGo that uses a symbolic state. Uh, there's no expert traces because they are randomly sampled. Uh, there's no rewards. There's no access to the simulator, so you cannot ask for more examples on the demand. On demand. And finally, there's no action symbols assigned to each pair. You don't know what action was performed. You need to uh, infer this only from the image input. Um, so, yeah, from the training input, the system learns some environment state or the transitions, and then given the planning input that depicts the initial state and the goal state, it tries to output a visualized ex plan execution in form of images again. So the system should be able to solve also the another type of domain. Um, this is the overall architecture. It takes two inputs, as I said before, uh, but and the, at its core, there is a fast downward classical planner. But the problem is the input is sub-symbolic, while the plan planner it needs to be symbolic. So we need to bridge a gap between this sub-symbolic representation and the symbolic representation. 
to do that, the first step is what we do is the propositional symbol grounding, which means uh, we use a neural network called state autoencoder to find the bidirectional mapping between the images and the propositional states. So the propositional states means a fixed size of big vectors, like if it's a uh, length 25, then it means a state with 25 propositions. So it's just 0 and 1. And the neural network can go back and forth between these um, two representations, the image and the propositions. After that, we learn an additional, uh, we additionally learn the action model using the action model acquisition module. Then after that, we can then after that, we can do the initial state, uh, use, uh, use the initial state and the action model to perform the classical planning, and then uh, produce a plan. We get the intermediate states, but the problem is that these are uninterpretable, but we can decode them back to the image state in order to get uh, something that, is in, that makes sense to humans. OK, uh, this um, state order encoder, that's the essential part, is an autoencoder. That it's a type of neural network that can perform unsupervised learning. And it, uh, uh, it essentially learns an identity function. Uh, it encodes the input x, that's the image, into a latent vector z, and then map them back to the image input. And the training is performed by minimizing the error between the input and the output. So this is called reconstruction loss. The problem is that this latent vector is usually real valued, so it's not compatible with the propositional reasoning. But we use a Gumbel softmax VAE that has an additional optimization penalty I describe later that enforces the latent space to be converged to a categorical representation. And specifically, if we use limit the number of categories to two, then it becomes propositional variables because it's a true false assignment. Now, before the training, the latent space is continuous. Output is random. But after the training, the con uh, latent space is uh, 0, 1. And output is uh, uh, input. Uh, in the previous paper, we proposed two action mo So that's the state autoencoder part. And in the previous work, we also proposed the action model acquisition module, two versions. The first one is a oracular cheating model that uses the entire state transitions. Another one is uh, another neural network-based machine learning method that learns from small examples. I don't describe the detail, but it consists of two additional neural networks that assigns action symbols to unlabeled stress transitions, also learns the effect, also learns the preconditions, and runs A star. Uh, but uh, while AMA1 is able to use a fast downward using a huge SAS plus file, the, this AMA2 is not, because uh, the action rule is embedded in the neural network. But yeah, these are, I don't touch these um, modules in, this in our new paper. So I just show you some uh, latest um, visualized example. OK, now the, finally the overview. Um, so our contribution is twofold. First, the closer theoretical analysis of the lat plan, especially the state autoencoder framework. And also, the secondly, the zero suppressed state autoencoder that is new that try to suppresses the meaningless bits to zero in the latent space. And this hugely um, accelerates, uh, uh, no, improves the performance. Um, so there is a problematic behavior in the, the latent space that was found by the lat plans SAE. So assume that you have an input. You encode them into the latent propositional state and decode them back to the output. This is fine. But if you do that same again, you might get uh, s only slightly different propositional states. Why, how come is that? There are bit flips, um, which means the latent representation is not unique even for the single Im same uh, visual image. Well, this is basically because a neural network can do whatever it wants to do. But uh, there are certainly harmful effects. The first one is uh, duplicate detection is compromised. Because there are essentially two, two versional states for a single image, so uh, these essentially duplicated states are not recognized by the d duplicate detection in A star or Dijkstra search. Another thing is the disconnected search graph. So assume that there are incoming edge and outgoing edge from, in, from and into this state. And assume that uh, the, the one incoming edge connects to only one version of the state, another version only connects to the another version of the state. 
Then the switch graph gets disconnected and the solution uh, is no longer found because the graph is disconnected and the goal is unreachable. So this is a huge problem. Um, so to um, show the direct reason of this um, behavior, I need to describe a little bit of a neural network. Uh, that maybe you don't want to hear about this, but uh, yeah, just briefly. There's a weight matrix, uh, the new single neural network layer is a mapping from a m-dimensional real-valued uh, vector to a n-dimensional real-valued vector. There's a weight, bat weight matrix, the input vector. There's a nonlinear function like sigmoid, that's a famous one. Uh, and uh, there's an output vector, that's a sigmoid of wx. Uh, there's a deep neural networks uh, that are just stacking, stuck the version of many layers. Um, now, Gumbel softmax, what does the Gumbel softmax VA does is uh, using the Gumbel softmax distribution as a sigma, as a non-linearity. Um, it uses the Gumbel distribution, that's a minus log of minus log of a uniform distribution. So this is, uh, every time you evaluate this formula, you get different values. And then the Gumbel softmax distribution takes the input uh, vector x and takes a softmax of the summation of Gumbel plus log wx over a uh, temper par temperature parameter tau that is annealed by an uh, exponential schedule. And this Gumbel softmax is necessary for learning the discrete representation using neural network. However, obviously it introduces the stochasticity because the Gumbel part is completely random. So that's the, the, well, the numer well, numerical reason of the, the actual implementation-wise reason of this problem. And furthermore, Additionally, the neural network weights in the decoder can learn to ignore some randomly flipping bits. So neural network generates the random bits. And uh, not only two, but there are third harmful effects. That's a hyperparameter tuning. It's a headache all the time. Um, assume that you have a network that is too large. Then you can get the accurate reconstruction but with the, there are certainly the unused capacity in the latent space. And if that unused capacity occurs, then the network start using them in a random way. But if you have something that is too small, then it fails to reconstruct the input because it's like compressed too much and some information gets lost while compressing the input to a latent space. That's propositional. So we need to find the right sized network, but finding the right size is very difficult because every time you need to train the neural network from a scratch, that's not affordable. Now we performed a theoretical analysis of the Laplace SAE. So this is, normal, this is a normal autoencoder. It tries to minimize the error between the input and output. Uh, this is a VAE that was originally pro uh, proposed, the uh, Gumbel softmax VAE. It tries to make the current latent distribution close to, to the target distribution. Um, so DKL, that's KL divergence. That's uh, kind of similar to the distance between distributions. So if you minimize it, then the Q becomes closer to P. Now, the, this Q is a current distribution, is a probability of the encoder uh, emitting a certain latent vector given a certain image. And our target is a Bernoulli distribution that's a completely random Boolean variable. That sounds weird. Uh, because, we, as we said earlier, we don't want any randomness. But the original formulation of the ICLR 70 paper is to make it closer to Bernoulli. But upon the closer inspection, we found that, well, it's my own code, but uh, um, the the sign of the KL divergence is actually opposite from the original propo uh, the proposed formalism, which means it's, it's doing something totally different. It's not getting closer to the Bernoulli distribution, but it's away from the Bernoulli distribution. And what does it mean? Um, and after we uh, play with some math, then we found that it's actually uh, minimizing the entropy of the latent space instead of uh, maximizing it. So that's the core finding. Uh, one of the core findings, it's doing the something that we started calling entropy regularization. It tried to make the latent space more stable. And it actually resulted in empirically better performance. And we wanted to go big. Uh, we proposed this uh, symbol stability problem, that's a sub-problem on symbol grounding problem, that gives a high-level picture of why this is so useful. So imagine if you are trying to ground some symbols from the, the raw observations. Then the, the symbolic representation needs to be uh, unique 
under some uh, equivalence relationship, like, uh, like uh, under some noise threshold. In no case, it's a noise threshold, but there are, like, it's problem specific. And the symbol prob stability problem, as we propose, is a problem of finding a stable symbolic representation of the raw inputs. And it's actually very important. The SSP affects uh, the old stochastic and machine learning or neural ne network based grounding methods. And actually, many recent neural network architectures use stochastic um, methods. So that's the problem. Also, a stochastic the stochasticity is not just from the neural network, but also from the environment. That's external stochasticity. Therefore, if you want to deploy something to the real world, like an image-based one, then this SSP is hugely important. And now, we further analyze this, uh, the entropy minimization. And we notice that it's not modeling the stochasticity of the X, that's external stochasticity itself. You cannot control that. Um, so we propose the zero suppress SAE that addresses uh, external stochasticity. Um, it tries not to use new bits for un insignificant changes. It penalizes the number of true bits. Uh, the, the, the bottom formula is the minimization criteria, criteria for the, the SAE. As a side effect, it also tries to make the number of bits being used smaller, which means there's no, less need for the hyperparameter tuning. Well, I, we conducted five experiments, but we only show three. Uh, the first one is the sensitivity of the proportional mapping to the input noise. Uh, we uh, sampled 100 images from a test data set and applied 100 different noise patterns that measure the variance of the latent space. And then it's significantly lower with the zero suppressed autoencoder. It achieves the most stable representation, also reduces the need for hyperparameter tuning. We, yeah, uh, because this is ICAST, we need to show the planning results. And uh, the, we show that actually with the AMA1 and AMA also, um, in AMA1, we achieve five times better uh, success ratio of finding a plan. And with AMA2, that's learned model, uh, action model, we have uh, performed the Valina SAE by 2.6% maximum. So this means that the graph disconnected issue that makes the problem unreachable are largely fixed. Another thing is the node expanded and the time spent. That's also reduced. And this is because the du duplicate detection is now working better uh, that, that I described earlier. So the conclusion, the take home message is that if you want to tame the neural network for the needs of classical logical reasoning, then you need to solve the symbol stability problem. You need a unique mapping from images. And then we show that a stable representation improves the planar success rate, efficiency on a hyperparameter sensitivity. And we also showed how to do this uh, in Laplan, which is entropy regularization that is already done in the previous work but was not noticed by myself. Um, the another thing is a zero suppressed state order encoder. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have time for questions. Yeah, so reasoning about uh, the symbolic uh, representation of the world from physical perception is really fascinating. Fascinating, so thanks very much for bringing this idea. And my question is, um, the classical planners are very sensitive uh, to the representation of, uh, of the propositions and the actions. And so I was wondering whether uh, is it possible to try to learn a representation that helps a given planner? Um, because some, for the same problem, different representations can give, uh, can help or not the planner. Uh, oh, could, could, could you uh, like make it a little bit larger the voice? Uh, the latter okay. part couldn't. Ah, sorry. Yeah, my question. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So my question was: uh, Is it possible to learn a, rep fin, to try to learn a representation that helps the planner uh, to solve the problem better? Because different representations of the same problem can make the problem difficult or easy to solve for the planner? Uh, you mean that, OK, so that to train the neural network more uh, like in a faster using the planner inside, like uh, combined, like while learning the representation, you also use planner. Is that what you mean? 
yeah, I, I don't have the. So sorry, I have no idea. <laughs> but for for instance, the number of uh, of propositions you want to to learn uh, can be different. For you might decide to I don't know to learn a, a 25 bit representation or 30 or even to I don't know. Yeah, we can talk offline. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I also have a question. Uh, so very nice uh, talk indeed. Um, I feel like the zero suppressed idea is uh, is close to the beta. Do you, are you familiar with beta VIE, like disentanglement for a variation? Uh. I, I think it's conceptually a bit similar. Also, trying to to find a unique representation and trying to suppress the unnecessary bits. So, have you have you looked into it or have you tried something? It seems si fairly similar to your suggestion. I would say. Uh, indeed, uh, there are many you know uh, many people try right, like. Uh, propose many additional optimization criteria to tame the neural network. Beta VAE is uh, actually uh, try to uh, make the meaning of a different uh, uh, cell in the latent space having a different meaning. Uh, that's, uh, well, yeah, the direction is similar, but uh, what they actually do is uh, the purpose is different. My case is uh, most look more similar to the L1, uh, L1, what, what was it called, a regularization. Uh, so um, that, but L1 regularization is typically for the continuous representation. This one is specifically designed for the discrete representation that's using the gamma of softmax. Okay. Um, beta, beta VAE, yes, certainly we are looking toward that direction. All right, yeah, one, one more. So very quickly, so the entropy regularization wait, so do you have any optimal way of choosing that value? Like, do you do some annealing? Do you use a fixed value? How do you choose it? Uh, I never thought about that. Uh, yeah, well, we just like uh, hope that um, the gr stochastic gradient descent goes toward the optimal. Doesn't ha I think uh, doesn't have to be optimal? I think um, no. If it's op, uh, yeah, the close enough is just enough. I think. Thank you. All right, well, let's thank him again. <laughs> and he'll, he'll remain on stage. Uh, so, so the next talk is unsupervised grounding of planable first order logic representations from images. Uh, thank you again. Um, yeah, now I'm moving to, yeah, same thing. Uh, uh, too long, don't read. Uh, so I made this new uh, benchmark domain that's uh, called the photorealistic blocks world that is already published in the, the GitHub. And then taking this domain, we output the plan like, uh, like, like before, but this time with predicates, not just propositions, with classical planning without Pullman. Yep, that's what we do. So what, what's uncool about the existing lab plan? That it is that uh, all we know is that the uh, variable assignments, the variable indices and its truth assignments, which is not at all interpretable, like because we only know numbers and not true and false. So the main target of this work is to improve the interpretability of the latent space by using some of the first order logic, not, although not fully. So um, if you go from propositional to the first order logic, now, uh, let's look at the propositional logic. It's just a true assignment to the distinct uh, the propositional variables, like p, true, q, false, and r, true. This is not at all, um, it doesn't make, you don't, you don't know the meaning of p and q. If you don't know the p meaning of p and q and r, then you cannot pass this result. But if you have uh, something predicate, then the true assignment is performed onto the tuple of the predicates and the arguments. And in this case, P Canada US is true, P US Japan is false, P US and Mexico is true. Then we can guess, humans can guess that the, this, the meaning of P can be interpreted as next to relationship. Even if this P itself, predicate itself is anonymous. So that's the main difference. And fundamentally, it is because the fast order logic provides a structured representation that is noted in the famous textbook where the arguments help the interpretation. So we propose first order state autoencoder, a neural network that uh, obtains an interpretable a discrete representation that is also compatible to the predator planner. 
So overview, its input is uh, uh, like this image, uh, cute uh, monkeys. Um, they are, uh, and then, but we do the object detection. You, we use the object detection results, such as YOLO, that emits a bounding box and the pictures inside it. So we, this is already an active research, and it's already kind of getting a high accuracy. So let's assume this is given. We don't do that. An output is an anonymous relational representation, like those using P1 and P2. Like monkey one is P1 in banana one. We don't know the meaning yet, but kind of we can guess that this is meaning uh, eating. So, yeah, we have the picture. We uh, perform YOLO, something like that, and get the feature vectors for each object. And then we do predicate symbol grounding. Not this time, not the propositional. This results in the first order logic state, that's P1, B1, M1, that's a banana and a monkey, is true. But the P1, B1, M2, that's a different monkey, is false because it's not eating. And this is compatible with the PDD solvers and also interpretable as eating. And if you have P2, M1, M2, that can be seen as siblings. An important assumption, again, uh, object detection is uh, given. Let this computer vision community do their job. Uh, but uh, predicate symbols are not given. Uh, these are unsupervised learning in order to address the knowledge acquisition bottleneck. Now, uh, kind of uh, large, this is a large network, but I describe step by step. This is the first order uh, state autoencoder. So the input is an image object, uh, list of object vectors. We next use a hard attention with gamma softmax, which doesn't make sense because I should describe atten what this attention is. Attention is a neural network that extracts an element uh, by a dot product. It's a neural network that uh, outputs uh, su some vector that sums up to one. And if you take the dot product, it's essentially taking one element out of the original matrix. This has been, this has been shown to be useful in many tasks like machine translation. Famous one is attention is all you need, that which took uh, best paper award, I think as far as I remember. And then another thing is memory head in a neural Turing machine. And although, but the, these existing work usually use a softmax, that means a soft attention that produces a probability vector instead of one whole vector. Which means if you take the dot product, then result is a mixture of multiple objects we don't want. And we want a single object inset for the sake of interpretability. So, uh, as again, we use hard attention that is activated by Gumbel softmax that converts to a one hot uh, representation, not just the probability vector that sums up to one. Here's a hyperparameter. We have three attentions here because we specify that we, our predicate is RT3. Uh, after taking the dot product, we get the argument list for the predicate. Um, and then using this argument list as a matrix input, we have separate several predicate networks that outputs a single Boolean value. Again, this is uh, uh, activated by Gumbel softmax, so it returns a true false assignment. Each predicate network represents a predicate, and there's a hyperparameter for the number of predicates. And finally, this step two, three, four, it form a single predicate unit, and there are multiple such units. So uh, in the Z direction in this slide. Uh, there's a hyperparameter for specifying the number of PUs. The important thing is that these are not sharing the argument list, but sharing the predicate network weights in order to ensure that each predicate network represents something sim uh, same the same function, same Boolean function. This also has an effect of uh, reducing the model parameters. And we, if you don't do this uh, PU network, PU uh, layer, PU, then like uh, every time only a single set of arguments are used by the network. But because we have multiple predicate units, we can apply different parameters, parameters to different, uh, to the same predicate to make it more generalizable. Now, finally, from the zero one vectors, we reconstruct the input. Um, this is the blocks world, as I said before, as shown before, and, then, and we just assume that uh, object detectors uh, extracts the object, 
as well as a bounding box. Uh, we, in this domain, there are three actions. The one is a move that is in the original blocks world. But we also have polish and unpolish action that changes the surface material of these blocks. Because we want to um, yeah, address some visual aspects, not just positions. Now we use this FOSAE to the extracted objects. And we assume that uh, there's a perfect object, de object detectors. So we just use the information from the image generators. In the future work, in a much more practical scenario, we can use uh, the real neural object detectors. Then we recite the image patch to a fixed size, 30 by two, 32 by 32, to get a feature vector that's 3,072 dimensions. And also the bounding box that's discretized by five pixels results in 200 dimensions. So each object has 3,272 dimensions in total. And we have like nine or five or four of these objects as an input. Uh, this is an example of the input reconstructions using hyperparameter UAP equals 10 to uh, 100. Uh, the reconstructed object vectors can be plotted on a black canvas because we already, the bounding box is reconstructed and also the feature vector is also reconstructed. Uh, this is the object-wide reconstruction. We see that it's pretty accurate, although there are some blurs on, in the output. Um, this is the result using the fast downward from the propositional latent layer. So we can show that uh, you can solve four blocks, although we didn't do many examples. But we did the ex ex exhaustive study on the NAS3 box version. And uh, you might be interested in the state space size. So three blocks has only 480 states. And we used uh, 432 examples to train a neural network. But for the, for the much larger state space, four blocks and five blocks, we endured that they also uh, the network converged to, uh, uh, to very low uh, loss reconstruction error. But we could not run the experiments on the fast downward because uh, the resulting SAS file is huge. It's like it, it, we failed even with the 128 gigabytes memory and waited for two uh, days, but it didn't finish. Um, the search time with three blocks is as follows. We produced 13 uh, problem instances uh, by uh, random walking from the goal state, three steps, so seven or 40 steps. And then we use the blind search in a fast downward in a SAS plus file that was generated. Uh, we use the search, uh, the search time is, yes, it's increasing for the larger problem, but the cost is uh, certainly uh, smaller than the length of the random walk because it's optimal algorithm. Now, uh, another claim that we did earlier is that are the predicates uh, meaningful or interpretable? We use a simpler eight puzzle domain that, is, uh, hand, that has a hand coded eight puzzle object vectors. So each row represents an object. The first nine bits are for the numbers, and the second six bits are for the, uh, the coordinate. Um, this is an example with the, uh, the 50 predicates here for SIE. We only showing the first five. We sampled from the test set. We sampled from that result that we sampled the argument that was selected by the attentions. And then categorize the arguments based on whether a certain predicate returns true or false. And all, everything that uh, returns true is on the left-hand side. And we see that, yeah, for each predicate, they have different patterns, but there are certainly patterns. And for example, for predicate one, they can, the rule can be described as x1 being 0, x, y1 being 0, and x2 is he doesn't care, and y2 is 1. Uh, the coordinate should be 1. Something like that. Now, as a conclusion, yes, the, this is the first thing, system, as far as I know, that grounds the predicate symbols uh, that are discrete and logical, that are compatible with the classical planning and in an uh, unsupervised manner. Uh, there are several uh, like approaches that claim that they found some relations, but the four phase to find a discrete representation that's logical. Also, it fa sometimes failed to resolve the knowledge acquisition bottlenecks because they just use human symbols, like something that human assigned the labels. Or the, un the, the, the attentions or the argument list could be uninterpretable or probabilistic. Like, if you want to find the has a relationship and if the neural network returns you that Bob has a 15% of cat and a 50% of dog, it doesn't make sense. 
doesn't make sense at all. So uh, the, as a future work, there's a uh, yeah, caveat. Um, the, it's not finding a quantified first order logical formula. So it's lacking the for all and exist. So that's what we need to address in the future work. But it's a, I believe it's an important step toward the full grounding of first order logical representation. Um, there's a Medium article in my uh, company that's about uh, um, what is this what IBM, MIT IBM Watson Lab is doing. That is, uh, one of its main tasks is to build a new generation of neural symbolic hybrid systems. I'm looking forward to this direction. I'm excited to move to Boston on the end of this month. Thank you. Questions? Okay, thanks for the talk. It's, a, it's quite interesting work. So, so I was wondering how robust this is to noise. If you move a block a bit in the image, how, how robust is this to... to, uh, uh, to it really to matters uh, be, uh, because uh, the object part is uh, kind of... Um, yeah, although it's um, from the image, it's a somewhat... Uh, Somewhat uh, hand coded because uh, first of all, the bounding box is uh, it discretized by five pixels and into a one hot vector already. So the bounding box, uh, the coordinates are one hot now. But we can use the real value for the, uh, the coordinate. And if you use that, then uh, the system should be quite robust because it's a neural network. It tries to minimize the, the, L, the Euclid distance of the coordinates. So it should be quite. Uh, at least uh, uh, robust. And as long as uh, the, the movement is within that five pixel, in the current, even in the current system, if it's at even in the five pixel, it doesn't change the result. So do you learn predicate symbols for each problem or for each domain? For each, uh, for each domain. So uh, if you change the, well, in a, in a broader sense of domain. So if you change the number of blocks, then that's problematic. That could be, but uh, maybe it works. I, don't, I never uh, they try that. Um, but uh, within the same set of blocks, then it should work for every state. Yeah, that basically, at, at this point, yes, it's treated as different domains. Hi. So uh, my question is about this talk, but also I think related to the previous one, and the kind of uh, I had the same kind of doubt in terms of uh, tuning the performance, and I guess refining the question is, have you considered using planning, planner performance as part of your cost function when you're training? I think that that's kind of mo the most obvious way to, to try to tune the encoding for the planner, but, or, or any variation thereof. Uh, possible, I like uh, that. That idea is uh, maybe in the end of my uh, brain room, but I never tried that myself. Yeah. Thanks. Very inter but uh, very interesting, uh, yeah, idea. I think. Um, in your neural architecture, you had parallel PU units that basically you're varying um, arity of the predicates and also number of predicates you want to extract, right? So I was, and that doesn't scale if you want to try different combinations of those. So I was wondering if either one of those dimensions can be learned by the network of how to, how to set the right number of predicates to extract and also the arity. Have you thought about that? Um, actually, um, well, it didn't go into the paper, couldn't fit it in the paper, so I removed it from the paper, unfortunately. But uh, like, uh, I also tried the, domain, the version that like uh, it takes uh, nine object slots, but the, um, only five of them are filled, and all the remaining are zero vector. And then, because uh, okay, because this uh, attention part is uh, so sort of tries to uh, adjust the positions by itself, so. Um, as, if, as long as you have the maximum number of slots, that's nine, that's larger than actual number of objects, then uh, it can handle variable um, or number of objects. But it's not, become, it's not in the paper, so um, yeah, hopefully in the future work. 
All right, so uh, you can ask other questions later, but let's thank the speaker one more time. So our, our next speaker is uh, Barham uh, Bazandian, uh, and the, the talk is going to be on fast feature selection for linear value function approximation. Sorry. Uh, let me open it. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Barham from University of New Hampshire. I'm going to talk about a new method in uh, feature selection in context of uh, reinforcement learning. The best way to describe this method is through an example. Uh, most of them know that, uh, most of you know that the, one of the most famous uh, benchmarks in reinforcement learning is the cardboard problem. In original cardboard problem, we are dealing with the uh, uh, balancing uh, pole on top of the cart. And uh, the idea is to apply force on the cart to maintain the balance of the pole. So um, the original state space is simple, something like two-dimensional, and we only have to uh, um, focus on the theta and theta dot, or angle and angular velocity of the pole to make sure that the pole is balanced or not. Uh, so if the agents can uh, maintain the balance of the pole at each time step, we call it a success. And if the pole passes some certain uh, angle from a vertical line, we call it a failure. But in our problem setting, uh, we're not dealing with the original state space. We are dealing with the image data. That, so for example, there's a camera is uh, observing the card pole uh, um, RGB camera, for example. So the agent doesn't have access to original state space. Uh, this setting is very similar to um, controlling Atari games that uh, you might know about that uh, they use this imagery uh, data, the pixel data from the emulator to control or play Atari games. Uh, because the state of space is now much larger than the original one, uh, we pre-process those images in order to make them a gray scale. So every scale is something between 0 and 255. And we crop it in a way that the pictures are more or less like that, the one in the middle. So we're dealing with much larger state uh, space dimension. Uh, we are using an uh, OpenAI gym uh, simulator. In OpenAI gym, the every time step that then you want to calculate the theta and theta dot of the states, you need to, uh, the simulator uses those formulation and equations to come up with that. But the, uh, the concept of time is missing in the image. So when one single uh, frame doesn't deliver that kind of information. So we have to, uh, create a sequence of image, or better say three frames in a row that creates a Markovian uh, state that the agents can extract those information from the three frames. So you see that the uh, spa state of space dimension is even higher than we expected. Uh, since we are dealing with the reinforcement learning problem, in the reinforcement learning, we are uh, trying to interact with the environment by selecting action. In a given state, the agents select an action and then the, the environment responded with the reward signal. So in our setting, in our problem, when the agent's trying to pick, the agents normally try to pick uh, left and right. And if the pole is balanced, the agent receives a, a plus one reward. 
And if it's not balanced, if it's failed, uh, receive a zero reward. And since this is well, somehow an episodic problem, we're going to stop every episode at uh, level 200 that the return can't be maximum more than 200. So the maximum return that the agent gets in every episode is 200. Uh, value function is the component in reinforcement learning that they're looking for. So if you find the true value function or optimal value function, you solve the problem. The idea is that the, the value function gives you a value of every single state that you're in. If uh, value of each state, I mean, you're always the agents try to get to those states with the maximum value. And it's the idea of predicting the uh, collective reward that you can get from that state onwards to the end of the episode. So uh, one of the way that you can calculate this, estimate this value function is linear value function. And the idea is to uh, combine the features, just a linear combination of features, or weighted linear combination of the features. So it's actually two problems. One of them is to come up with good features for that state. And the second is finding those Ws, which is uh, also uh, define the value function itself. In this talk, we don't talk about Ws, how to find the Ws, because there are methods already uh, helping us to find them. Um, for example, we use a fixed point method for that. Uh, but we are talking about how to find those features from um, the state space, this from the state. In the image case, for example, it's like a weighted sum of the pixels number for every single state. But um, the problem with that is, uh, first of all, we are de dealing with the state action, meaning that every state we need to choose an action, and we need a new set of Ws for every separate action. So we added those uh, blocks, zero blocks to the state to show that the difference between taking action left or taking action right at, at every single uh, state. So the dimension of the state space is now is something like 11,000 compared to the 2D at the beginning. Uh, so the problem's getting more complicated as we go forward. Now we are dealing with too many features, too many pixels that we have to interpret at every single state. And the problem with that is obviously overfitting, which is due to curse of dimensionality. The more dimension you have, uh, when the dimension of space is so high, it uh, doesn't matter how many samples you, are, you have, the dimension is going to be sparse, and learning in a sparse uh, space is very hard. And computational complexity because of the so many features that you need to deal with. So there are methods to, uh, to overcome these problems. One of the famous ones is regularization which is just adding more information to the ILPOS problem. And the method that we are interested in in this talk is feature selection, meaning the su we are looking for a subset of features instead of using all the features, or generating much smaller number of features from the original raw input features, which is in this case of Cartwell is just pixel data. So our contribution is a new fast method to create these features from the raw input data. And the method is relying on the low rank approximation of a transition matrix. So the transition matrix just uh, explains the, the dynamic of the system um, or a Markov decision process model. And uh, we also provide some theoretical work for uh, finding the upper bound on the Bellman error, which is important in the context of reinforcement learning. And also, we have some sort of insight in the or final version of the value function that gives us some idea how value function is deciding over the uh, actions. Uh, there are many different uh, feature selection methods that I'm just mentioning the most important one. Uh, Proto-value function, which is related to the connectivity of the states. Uh, spectral approximation, finding this feature or better say, uh, basis function from the transition matrix, is trying to find the um, eigenvectors of the transition matrix and use them as feature. Krylov subspace is about finding the images of, images of the raw, uh, reward function uh, uh, projecting on the transition matrix or power of transition matrix. Bellman error basis uh, functions are trying to find these features from Bellman error. And the most relevant uh, features to our uh, talk is uh, linear feature discovery. And because it's very similar to our work, we, I'm going to explain it in the next slide. So linear feature discovery 
is somehow a batch reinforcement learning, meaning that uh, you collect your samples from the uh, system, and then you, it's like that you don't, need, you don't need to collect new samples or you're not able to collect more samples. Uh, in this work, they uh, put all of the state actions, uh, of the current state actions in one matrix. I show it with matrix A. And then uh, they put the next state as uh, action corresponding to that state space in the another block matrix, matrix A prime. And uh, they're looking for encoder, linear encoder and decoder to predict the next state action. So the encoder um, is trying to reduce the dimensionality of the current state action, and then the decoder brings it back to the next state action. In the same time, they're trying to predict the reward vector. So this is somehow a iterative uh, process, and it's coming from um, coordinate descent. Uh, the idea here is to find that encoder and use them for uh, features. But the problem with this method is that uh, it takes a long time to uh, converge, or sometimes doesn't converge. And the final result of encoder is not always fixed. The other problem is that they're trying to solve a non-convex optimization problem, which is going to be a problematic by itself. Uh, our method is uh, somehow related to this, that I'm going to explain it here. Uh, so we use the same uh, matrices that I just described in the previous matrix, uh, the previous slide. Uh, we want to generate the com compressed transition matrix of the model, which means that you're just projecting your original transition matrix over the raw features or raw um, samples that you got from the beginning. Uh, the equation on the top corner shows exactly how we calculate this transition matrix. And we try to um, l approximate this matrix by low rank approximation or singular value decomposition. So uh, you can see in that uh, picture in the corner that the, the transition matrix is going to be uh, decomposed to two different matrix. The matrix U1 is actually the left singular vectors of the transition matrix. And we figured out if you combine that with the reward projector, uh, which is uh, also a projection of the reward on the features, on the raw features. And this combination gives us, gives us a very robust um, feature that we can use for controlling the carpool. So uh, one of the most factors to evaluate a good um, value function or evaluate a good set of features is to measure it with Bellman error. The smaller Bellman error meaning that the approximation that you're having is closer to the true one. So our method is saying that uh, if the transition probability is low rank, so that uh, low rank approximation uh, um, leads to a zero Bellman error, meaning that our true, our approximation is uh, pretty much the same as the optimal one. And even if the transition matrix is not low rank, the Bellman error is equal to the most significant singular value that you throw away in your approximation. And this, very, uh, this is a very good analytical interpretation because uh, we always look for a measure to find out if the final value function is really useful or not. Here I'm uh, comparing the uh, method that I describe, the linear feature discovery, and also our method, fast feature selection, it's very interesting to see that, uh, for example, we, with collecting 200 episodes with a random policy, we s collected 200 episodes of samples with a random policy, and we generate features to control the carpool. And uh, uh, after 200 episodes, we could just uh, get to the maximum performance. And the reason it's not more than 200 because we stop every episode at 200, and it's, not, it's impossible to collect more rewards or uh, keep the poll balance. Uh, the other advantage of this method is the speed. Uh, compared to um, that linear feature discovery, for example, we are somehow six times faster, something around five times faster when in the bigger data set, like 600 episode collection. And this is important because the problem that we are solving is pretty much simple, but then you're dealing with much bigger problem. You need to collect much more samples, and this is going to be mm, much more scalable compared to the, uh, the other method. And uh, this picture is showing the coefficients of the linear value function. The coefficient means that when you, for example, have a three-frame image from your carpool, you can multiply every single with these numbers, and you get your uh, Q, Q value, or the value of the state. 
And it's interesting to see that the how agents figured out the dynamics of the carpool without having access to the original state space. So if the pole is in the middle, you get a higher value. And the reason of that, because the pole, uh, the, mm, mm, those uh, uh, pixels that represent the pole is black, meaning they are zero. So when, they, when the pole stands in the middle, you get the uh, much bigger value than, than the compared to the location that the pole is about to fall. And that was very interesting for us that you can see this uh, uh, through a linear value function, but normally it's harder to see this kind of uh, um, insight in a different methods like black box method that you don't see what's happening exactly inside. As a conclusion, uh, I have to say this problem of feature selection or feature genera no, generation is n an unsolved problem. It's a very hard problem that still a lot of people are working on it. And uh, since uh, it's a very um, uh, interesting topic that is not solved yet how to represent the state with a smaller number of features. And our method is just a contribution to that uh, path that is trying to uh, construct these features from the transition matrix. And uh, this method is somehow more robust than the previous one because we are defining this theoretical analysis and um, proof that the, the Bellman error is small in the final value function. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for listening. Hey, do we have questions? Thanks. So it seems to me that you need to cover all the state space to get um, to get an optimal policy. Not necessary because you collect samples. These samples are representing a partial part of the state space, and this gener uh, producing the features in a lower dimension tries to generalize the whole state space. So the, the policy we use to collect the samples is random. And using a random policy meaning that you don't know what you're getting. But the, the idea of making this compressed uh, dimensional feature space is trying to generalize those yeah. uh, samples that you're getting. So it's not necessary that you collect. Or maybe in some cases that you don't get, the, get, to, get, get to the most important uh, states, for example, in mounting car. When you have a random policy, you never get to the top of the mountain. Yeah, so, so, so in those cases, maybe you're right. Because we never have a sample that achieves any reward. Right. But uh, in the, if you have an av average type of uh, policy that gets you to those states at least once or twice, then it's still possible to generalize. Generalize. OK. Thanks. Yeah, so, so I guess I'll ask a question. So, so you're dealing with images here, which is very, very unintuitive that you would use a linear function for, for images. Uh, so do you have anything to, so, so I, I would expect that most policies for images will need to be nonlinear. Yes. Do you think you have, like this has any insights into? So the insight would be maybe uh, if you look at DQNs, the architecture, normally the first layers are trying to extract feature. And the last layer is a linear layer. So it's sometime, somehow it's like if you figure it out the features, then the last layer is a linear value function. And uh, that uh, also give us the idea that the, everything could be done in the linear function if you have a great feature. And uh, the, uh, the idea is to uh, maybe this kind of work can be combined with the deep nets. But we want to, uh, we want to say even with the singular value decomposition, you can generate those good features that you don't really have to use deep net. And this is much faster and gives you the uh, Bellman error bound. And this bounds doesn't exist in the, for example, deep learning or black box learning. And gives you much more uh, guarantee that your final value function or final policy is going to help you to uh, get to mm, best return that you're expecting. Um, that was the idea. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you. Let's uh, thank the speaker again. So, so uh, last but not least, uh, we've got our technical difficulties out of the way. Um, so we have uh, Tanvi Verma, uh, who's going to give the last talk of this session. Uh, maximum entropy-based independent learning in autonomous, anonymous uh, multi-agent settings. Thanks, Alan. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Tanvi from Singapore, and it is a joint work with my advisor, Pradeep Varakantam and uh, Hong Chuin Law. My work is motivated by the problems when there are multiple agents present, and matching of agent to customer demand is done on a continuous basis. For example, taxi aggregation companies match uh, taxi drivers to the customer demand. Aggregation companies use uh, services of uh, delivery boys and delivery vans to uh, deliver th uh, food. And uh, for online shopping, the aggregation companies uh, connect uh, shippers to the traveler or uh, courier personnel to serve the same day delivery requests. Uh, there are few characteristics of these domains. Uh, the interaction between these individuals are anonymous. That means, for example, whether a demand will be assigned to a taxi driver or not is dependent on the number of other taxis present in that location and not on the identities of the taxis. These individuals are self-interested and they want to maximize their own long-term revenues. And typically, a large number of agents are present in the system. Uh, for example, there are around 40,000 taxi drivers in a small city like Singapore. And most importantly, the goals of aggregation companies to maximize the, the overall revenue is not aligned with the goals of these individuals. However, these uh, individuals can utilize framework of reinforcement learning to learn policies to be at right location at right time such that their long-term revenue is maximized. But there are a few challenges in using reinforcement learning. Presence of multiple agents makes the environment non-stationary. That means uh, when an agent receives a payoff, it is not just because of his uh, own action, but it is resultant of the joint action of everyone. And uh, these agents are non-cooperative and non-communicative, so you won't be able to know what others are doing. And the scale of problem is very large. Generally, in uh, these aggregation domain, uh, the, uh, the work is focused from the perspective of aggregation companies. For example, how to maximize the overall revenue, or how to minimize the customer waiting time, or maybe how to maximize the number of demands served. In our work, we, work, uh, we uh, see it from the perspective of these individuals present in the system, and uh, we provide an independent learning method in non-cooperative, anonymous multi-agent domain when the agent pop population is really large. So let me talk about some background first. Independent learning in multi-agent setting, uh, setting, the researchers have uh, proposed some work, but the, related, the relevant work, they uh, still assume uh, some access to some more information. For example, JPC assumes uh, access to some predefined policy oracle, whereas the LOLA assumes that the individuals can view the learning parameters of other agents. So these assumptions are not valid in our domain. Another thread of work is centralized learning with decentralized execution, where they assume the presence of a central entity which provides more information at the time of learning. For example, in our case also, the aggregation companies can act as central entity, but as mentioned, they are self-interested and they might not want to reveal the true information to these independent learning individual agents. So, uh, in our work, we model the problem as anonymous multi-agent reinforcement learning, and we provide an independent learning framework. So the, the model is uh, represented using these tuples, where n is the number of agents, state space s is the vector of location of all the agents, and action a is the action space, where in case of aggregation domain, the action represents the zones to move, T is the transition probability, and R is the reward function. Now, from an independent learner's perspective, the individual agents cannot view the true global state of the, these, the, these uh, state vectors. 
But we assume that uh, they can view the number of other agents present in their current location. We also defined DS as the agent population distribution, and DZS is the number of agents in zone Z when the global state is S. Now, what is the learning experience for these individual agents? So this is a learning experience of the individual agents. I know lots of symbols there, but I'll explain it. It means when the agent is in zone Z, and the number of ag uh, agents present in that zone is DZS, where S is the global state, which the agent cannot view. And uh, the agent took uh, action A. It received the immediate reward R. And it moved to uh, zone, zone Z dash. And the number of agents present in that uh, zone is uh, D, Z, D dash, D, Z dash, S dash. So we can see that I have highlighted it in different color that the combination of zone and number of agents present can be viewed as a local uh, state for these individual agents. Then the transition function for the individual agents would be uh, taking an action in its local space and moving to the next zone. And the reward function is again uh, taking an action A in its local state and receiving some immediate reward. Now let us look at the global state transition function. So go global state transition function is nothing but the multiplication of all the agents transition, local transition probabilities. Uh, here the uh, bold A is the joint action. Now from an individual's perspective, we can again rewrite it like this, the, uh, its own transition probability multiplied by the overall transition probability of rest of the agents to move to state S dash. And the individual learners can learn Q values of its local state and action using the normal Q value equation, which is the immediate reward, and uh, plus uh, discount factor multiplied by the global transition function, and the maximum uh, payoff it can receive in from the uh, next state onwards. Now we can see that this transition probability is the ma main non-stationarity part of this model. So in our work, we predict this probability distribution by predicting the future agent population distribution. And we focus on improving the prediction. So we can see that this probability can have multiple values. So we, we want to predict, and it it is continuous. So we want to predict well, most probable uh, value of the next state's agent population density distribution. So the key idea is to uh, maximize entropy of the predicted future population agent population distribution, which is inspired by principle of maximum entropy, which I will explain in uh, next slide. And also, if the agents agents are taking an action in such that uh, the uh, population distribution, um, entropy of the population distribution in the next time step is maximized. And if everyone is taking that action, then it will reduce the uncertainty in the action of other agents, what others, others are doing. So it will reduce the non-stationarity. And uh, because the transition and reward functions are homogeneous, and only all the uncertainty comes from the policies of other agents and maybe the demand arrival. So if we decrease the non-stationarity, then it, is, it will decrease the variance in the experiences of all the learning agents. Now coming to the principle of maximum entropy, it states that the best model of a predict, uh, probability distribution is the one that assigns an unbiased non-zero probability to every event that is not ruled by the past data. So the idea is to uh, maximize the entropy uh, related with the, your pred prediction based on the, these constraints. The, the, so in, in our case, this is how the entropy will be c computed for over all the zones, what is the predicted density, and this is the maximize uh, entropy of the probability density uh, distribution. 
and because it is a probability then uh, it should sum to 1 and the expected values. So suppose uh, you have seen uh, there are k experiences of viewing uh, agent uh, densities in zone Z dash, then the expected value of those that prediction should be similar to what you have seen in the past. To incorporate these things into our model, we propose two algorithm, density entropy DQN and density entropy advantage actor critics. So for this constraint maximization of entropy along with the reinforcement learning process, we modify the state of the art deep Q network and ATC network by adding one more output layer for the density prediction like this. And for then we use well, in the target key values when we use uh, in the neural network, we add one entropy term for, of the predicted density. And uh, we compute uh, softmax on the prediction. And to, uh, for the expected value to be same as what we have seen in pa on an average in past, we minimize the mean square loss of the density prediction. Then we performed experiments on two domains. The first one is taxi simulation using real world data set where uh, we take the real world demand distribution, we take the map of the country and then we, we based on the uh, data, GPS locations, we convert the map, we divide the map into multiple zones and for uh, then we take the corresponding demand distribution from the real, data, uh, real world data set. We also perform a, a, a synthetic simulator, which is online to offline service simulator. We use Gridwell uh, to uh, simulate uh, this simulator, and uh, we, comp uh, we generate different different scenario based on the demand pattern. What is the trip pattern? So demand is demand to agent ratio based how many agents are present in the system and what is on average dem demands are being generated in the grid. And the trip pattern, so it's quite possible that there are zones uh, which uh, generally receive long, long distance trip. For example, uh, airports which are generally outside the city and they will receive longer trips as compared to city center where uh, the trips will be shorter. And the comparison matrix we use is the average payoff of all the agents, which would be the, we, we can view as, as the social welfare. So if the values are, values are higher, that means the agents are serving more demand uh, in aggregation. And the second one is the variance in the payoff of individual agents, which we, we have shown using box plots. And if the variance is less, that means everyone, it's, it's a fair policy and everyone are learning fair policies, though they are learning independently. We also compare with mean Q field uh, algorithm, uh, which can be treated as an upper bound because they assume access to joint action as well. Before going to the main results, let me show this uh, error plot, which is the error between the project, uh, predicted agent population distribution and the true agent population distribution. So we can see that as the learning progresses, the error comes down and it converges to very low value. That means what the uh, agents are predicting is in reality closer to what exactly ha is happening um, in reality. Now coming to the real world data set, uh, so we took the proportional demand for 100 agents and there were 111 zones. So the first one we can see that as the learning progresses, the social welfare value uh, for uh, the algorithms, they perform better than the state-of-the-art uh, DQN and A2C algorithm. And uh, the agents were able to serve 10% more uh, demand in terms of revenue, overall revenue. And we can see that uh, the variance in their uh, individual payoff is also lesser than the variance of DQN and A2C. Sim, uh, we saw similar results for our uh, uh, simulator, where uh, this experiment, there were 50 agents in 25 zones, and demand to agent ratio was 0.75. And the trip pattern was non-uniform. That means there were few zones with shorter trips, and there were few zones 
which which uh, got uh, long, long longer trips and here also we can see that they were uh, uh, they were able to serve 15 percent more demand in terms of revenue and uh, variation is also lesser than the, uh, the other two algorithms so in conclusion uh, we provide a method for independent learning in anonymous multi-agent domains and we empirically saw that the payoff of individuals improved in a simulated uh, aggregation domains. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions. This may, may be naive, but in, in a distributed taxi environment, if every agent is learning using the same kind of data, they might all converge to the same policy. So but they might all go to the airport, and no one will serve some other parts of the city. So I, I'm just, I didn't quite get how your method will get around something yeah. like that. Yeah, so I have tried to emphasize that it is independent learning. So everyone is learning from their own experience. It's not a centralized data which everyone is learning against. So everyone is learning from their own experience. And in these kind of uh, domain, everyone's action, because I'm uh, predicting the density distribution, agent population distribution over the next time period, so what, what action everyone takes affects those distribution. And everyone is learning from their own experience. So it, it won't be that everyone is learning the same policy. So that's why we see the variance. If everyone has learned same policy, then their expected payoff would be the same. But there are few agents who are performing better than some agents. So some of them has uh, learned uh, on an average better policies. But what I have tried to show that even if everyone is learning different policy, the variation is lesser because they are using this prediction method and inspired from maximum entropy. They're trying to maximize the entropy of the prediction. So, so I guess I had one question. I, I think I did not understand. Um, you, you had an equation for your Q learning target, the, the Y, I, and you, you added on some entropy yes. there, but I, I didn't understand why or yeah, what, what that would converge to. Sorry. So because uh, yeah, so uh, because what I have mentioned that I want to have this constrained maximization of entropy along with the re reinforcement learning framework. So that's why this is the entropy of what we are what each agent is predicting. So entropy of that prediction because we want to maximize that. And in the reinforcement learning framework, we are all also maximizing the reward, expected reward. So that's why I have used both the, both the terms here in my Q-value uh, Q target prediction, such that I'm maximizing my return as well as I'm maximizing the entropy of my prediction in the same go. Well, uh, it's a little past lunchtime, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you.